While in former centuries the Church prayed for the protection of people against natural disasters, we now face the need to pray for the protection of nature against human destruction. We already lost almost 20% of the Amazon rainforest and the deforestation is still going on. If you don't know about it, you don't care about it. If you're not making any money out of it, why bother to save it? It's a war. We have under a war here. How can we stay quiet with this? I think humanity become like ant. They just eating, they just destroying. They're not planting for new generation. Unless you are in good relationship with nature, your very existence is threatened. July 2006. A symposium on the environment takes place on a ship in the Amazon, bringing together religious leaders from many faiths, scientists from various disciplines, indigenous leaders, environmentalists, policy makers, and the media, all under the leadership of the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew spiritual leader to the world's 300 million Orthodox faithful. Let us consider our own presence on this great river. This river comprises a microcosm of our planet. In its waters, we observe many of the world's ecological issues. We have come to listen to its story, to learn from its history. The ecumenical patriarch, dubbed the Green Patriarch by Al Gore, has placed environmental issues at the top of his agenda. He established the organization Religion, Science and the Environment to bring together two often estranged communities, those of religion and science. Uh, when I was invited, I was a little bit suspicious because, uh, as you know, Scientists don't look to religion with uh, a lot of trust, and, and I think it's vice versa. Religion and science have been for centuries, uh, sometimes in conflict, sometimes uh, they followed their different ways, uh, as if they had nothing to do with each other. The indigenous are another group historically estranged from Western religion. When Europeans, soldiers and priests, arrived 500 years ago, there were some 7 million living in the Amazon. Disease, massacres, slavery and forced conversions reduced the population to a few hundred thousand by the 1950s. Though no longer threatened by extinction, they are still generally perceived as a primitive people with little, if anything, to contribute. que a consciência das pessoas pensar do índio mude, não pensar que o índio coitadinho, o índio só de três penas, não é isso. Nós temos que ver a realidade. Então essa questão vai mudar. Nós respondo para eles, eles vendo, entendendo, aí muda a mentalidade das pessoas também. Isso não vai nos contribuir muito. É isso que nós esperamos do simpósio. In recent decades. The natural world, the natural environment, has told us in a very loud and clear way that if we are to protect and preserve its natural resources for future generations, people need to talk, people need to work together. There needs to be some sort of common language, some sort of common vision. Five previous symposia brought the participants together on a ship 
to travel a particular body of water with shipboard meetings and visits on shore to particular ecological hotspots, as well as successful programs of sustainability. Unlike the previous five symposia in European waters, the Amazon has a global impact. What happens in the river and the rainforest matters for the rest of the planet. The goal of this, the sixth symposium, was to first accurately assess reality in the Amazon basin and the global impact of deforestation, and then, more importantly, propose sustainable solutions to preserve the forest for future generations, rather than destroying it. There's been a tremendous amount of deforestation over the last 30 years. An area larger than France has been deforested here. The forest part of Brazilian Amazonia is approximately the area of Western Europe. So the area of France gives you an idea of how much has been cleared. When you have deforestation, that does release a significant amount of carbon. And because half of the dry weight of the trees is carbon, either burning a tree or letting the tree rot, most of it will become carbon dioxide. And the rest will become things like methane, which have even more impact on global warming. The Amazon flora is important mainly for its terrific diversity. And it is that diversity that helps it to function as a forest or the interaction, a web of interactions that holds it together. And that means that it is important to the whole world as uh, its influence on climate. In one day, a big tree can put up to 300 liters of water in the atmosphere. And if you multiply the area of the Amazon, a single day Amazon can put up to 20 billion, billion tons of water in the atmosphere. This is way more than what the Amazon River discharge in the ocean in the same time, in one day. So this gives you a measure of the importance of the forest to the climate system. It's a massive pump. It's a hydrological pump. We always knew the trees are good for fresh air, for oxygen, etc. But the connection of trees with water, how trees can pump water out of the ocean inland and make the, the water cycle function inland. And when you lose the trees, then the land becomes progressively arid. In the Amazon basin, we have glaciers in Bolivia that are melting faster than the glaciers in the Arctic. We also are facing a problem of warming the waters of the Atlantic Ocean. And this warming is diverting the moist that comes into the Amazon, and this is increasing the frequency of hurricanes, apparently, in North America, and apparently also increasing the frequency of severe droughts in the Amazon. Last year in the state of Acre, for the first time, was a really dry season. Never happened before, like rainfall burned by itself, like a river, like the, the water comes very tiny, the big river. What happened last year with the drought induced by the Atlantic is that it, wasn't, it was a strong drought, dried the rivers, but it wasn't strong enough to, to dry the water in the soil that feeds the trees. So the trees didn't die. But if you have that two years in a row, then you start having tree mortality and die back. And if you have four years, over. It's over, you know, the system, because this forest cannot stand a drought for a long time. What has caused this headlong deforestation, which has taken place only over the last decades? The paradigm that's driving Brazil at the moment is certainly the gung-ho development. And this has come from the Western world. Well, Brazil really is one that, uh, a country that was founded on European ideals. And so 
what we have here is a conflict. The forest is perceived to be something that stands in the way of development and progress. At the moment, it's a, it's a one-way bet. You can make money by cutting it down, and you can't make a living by keeping it standing. Back in the late 1960s, the generals ruling the country feared that if the Amazon basin remained underpopulated, Brazil could lose control of that infinite empty space. And so they embarked on an ambitious road building and settlement program. The centerpiece of this new policy was the Trans-Amazonica Highway, which sliced directly into the heart of the Amazon. This and other so-called penetration roads led to development spreading outwards from the highways, which resulted in the cutting down of the rainforest for logging, mining, cattle ranching, and agriculture. Não, a B não funcionou porque ela não trouxe aquilo que eles tinham planejado, que era o progresso. Não trouxe. Foi fazer devastação da, da, da floresta, as matas, dos engarapés. Foi isso que, que deu nessa construção dessas estradas. The Trans-Amazonic Road was opened by the military with no planning uh, and uh, open areas of the Amazon for economic exploration that should not be done in those parts. Uh, for cattle ranching, for instance, that we know is not appropriate for most of the Amazon. Cattle ranching in the Amazon contributed to Brazil becoming the world's largest beef exporter. But it also led to rampant deforestation, water contamination, and lawless violence. Today, the fastest developing export and the cause of more deforestation than logging and ranching is the growing of soya. To see firsthand the impact of soya production, the symposium participants flew from Manaus in the state of Amazonas to Santarém in the state of Pará, a major producer of soya where 40% of the forest has been clear cut. We came, local, local we came to see and to learn, right. not to speak. Okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> to see with our own eyes. To see, to hear, to hear and to analyze. To listen to the people. In 2000, 99, 2000, the soya crops, soya plantations, started to, to invade the, the Amazon forest. The problem in the Amazon is that the soil is not appropriate for it. So most of the cultivation is short term. That means that you get a good crop for three years or so, and then you have to cut down more forest and leave that land abandoned. It is unfortunate what's happening because uh, the agricultural frontier on soybean has moved north very rapidly uh, for, I believe, a variety of reasons. First, the price of land. Second, lawlessness that allow people to clear federal lands without fear of punishment. Kill forest, 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 forest. It happened in the last five years. Yeah. So, this is, uh, so it hurts. This is, not a this is not private property. National land. This is That's national land or occupied illegally. This is Here. part of a there it is. is. In, in so many years, we're talking uh, about five years, four or five years, the rate of deforestation grew a lot, in, principally because this industry behind the farmers, like Cargill, Bungie, Adam, three American companies, and one Brazilian one, one group, Maggi, uh, that have the capacity to finance the destruction. Cargill, the world's largest private company and the world's largest exporter of grain, illegally built a major deep water facility in Santarém for the export of soya. This major access to European markets from the Amazon increased export earnings for Brazil on the one hand and on the other greatly increased headlong deforestation, both legal 
and illegal. Soybean has taken over and that is motivated by the Brazilian government's need for a good economy. They've made a lot of money out of soybean, so they're reluctant to curb the growth of soybean. The impact of the soil has been very big and very suffered for our category. First, because our workers were obliged to leave their country. We have had, obviously, very tragic episodes uh, involving the death, the killing of activists. And more recent, we had one involving Sister Dorothy Stang. In February of 2005, Sister Dorothy Stang, an American-born, naturalized Brazilian nun who was outspoken in her efforts on behalf of the poor and the environment, was gunned down by assassins hired by local ranchers. Held at gunpoint, she read a line from the Gospel of St. Matthew. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall be satisfied. She was trying precisely, working in a project with the Brazilian government to prove the viability of uh, keeping the forest there. Então, outros casos, é, na semana que a irmã Dorothy morreu, morreram também quatro, trabalha, quatro trabalhadores foram assassinados também, mas eles não tinham nome igual a mim, igual aos os outros que também não tem nome que possa repercutir. Então, nós éramos 63 na lista negra que a gente chama no ano passado, mas, e foram assassinados 11 e no ano de 2005. To me, if there is one thing that would make it change, it's something that we need in Brazil, not only for the Amazon, uh, but uh, to all things. It's the respect of rules, and it's law enforcement, and it is justice enforcement. There is no need, uh, necessity to new laws. The laws are there, so uh, which right has someone from Another region comes here with fire in the forest, uh, generate uh, an environmental crime, uh, illegal occupation in a land of all Brazilians to use for himself. Uh, unfortunately, the speed of destruction is 10,000 times more than the speed of justice in the Amazon. The Orthodox theologian, Metropolitan John of Pergamon, in his address to the symposium, sought to more profoundly explore how we have come to this impasse. It is the fact that in our Western culture, a crisis has occurred between the human being and nature. We no longer understand ourselves as parts of nature. This seems to be our fundamental difference from the indigenous people of this land as well as of other lands. What can we learn from cultures different from our own in order to restore our broken relationship with nature? The indigenous people consider themselves part of nature, not those that own nature, not those that dominate nature. They relate, it's a relationship with the environment and that's what really counts. They are part of nature and if the part wants to survive, the whole has to be healthy also. Sim, nós acreditamos que a, o homem, ele está nesse meio, né? Então, tudo é sagrado. Então, a água, a terra, a natureza, as montanhas, ela é a vida e você depende dessa vida. Então o homem ele não se separa disso para o homem. The Yao now have a consciousness about how important the environment 
because we depend on this to live every day. We are people that we're hunting, we're fishing, we construct a house, our canoes from the rainforest. We do this not, not just now, we do this forever. The indigenous peoples on the whole cut down a small piece of forest and they grow their crops intensively and then they cut another bit, but they leave the forest to regenerate, they use the regenerating forest. And they have many myths and beliefs that help to protect the forest. Some of their taboos are vitally important because uh, that is part of why they don't do things that are totally destructive of the environment. Jogar lixo na água, eu acho que é imperdoável. Eu fico pensando, né? É para onde que, da onde que, que tem coragem de jogar lixo dentro da água? É um pecado, quer dizer, é imperdoável que eu digo assim, porque eu não entendo por que, que, que há isso, né? Porque tem que, tem que abrir um pouquinho a cabeça para entender isso, que você está fazendo um, um, um dano. We think that all this, this global war and all this problem of Catherine and tsunami and the uh, dry season in Amazon here, uh, this is how that the whole people created that. And I think the whole spirit is really sad about what humans are doing with them. I think one of the lessons of, that, that, that you gain from working with indigenous people is just a completely awe-inspiring respect that you end up with because you know you can go in with the idea that you know it all because you come from a very sophisticated sort of community and society but actually you end up by realizing that you know very very little compared to what they know and just to illustrate that you know indigenous people throughout the Americas you know always have considered the consequences of their actions to the tune of six or seven generations whereas our actions tend to be more governed by the demands of quarterly earnings. While today the indigenous people number close to 500,000, they are but a small minority amongst the 23 million other inhabitants in the Brazilian Amazon basin. The population is a diverse blend of ethnicities, cultures and economic situations. 70% live in cities, many in the same poverty as elsewhere in Brazil. All seek a decent standard of living, which poses the question, is it feasible to both grow the economy and protect the environment? Symposium participants visited a number of small communities striving to find that sustainable balance. The ecumenical patriarch and the participants were welcomed in the community of Maguari in the Tapajos National Forest in the state of Pará. The inhabitants derive a sustainable living from the forest and the river. One of their main economic activities involves rubber, from tapping to processing to making products such as handicrafts and clothing accessories. Another visit was to Ramal Diamante del Norte, a homesteading community not far from Manaus. Here, nine families pooled their meager resources to construct a fish farm, doubling their investment in only one year. They also have a thriving nursery, currently working on a large order to be shipped off to Manaus for landscaping purposes. The federal and state governments have sought to protect the rainforests by creating national parks, indigenous reserves by granting title to tribal lands, and conservation units. A visit was made to the Mami Rao Sustainable Development Reserve, the largest area of protected flooded forest reserves in the world. The project was initiated in 1992 
to conserve biodiversity and for sustainable development for already existing communities. It's home to many rare and endangered species. In early 2002, it was open to ecotourism and profits are put into community projects and scientific research. While these government-sponsored programs offer hope for some inhabitants, the lot of many remains difficult, barely living at a subsistence level. An ongoing government resettlement program, begun in the late 60s, offered homesteaders a 25 hectare allotment of land and technical and financial assistance on condition that they only clear 20% of their land. Unfortunately, the promises of technical assistance and startup financing were generally not kept. Antonio is one of the tens of thousands of landless who have left the poverty of the coast in hopes of improving their situation. De 60 anos e não conseguiu sobrar. A gente produzia, mas muito produto e não valer nada também não é essas coisas. Né? He's forced to produce charcoal, which is illegal, since he's cutting down more than the 20% allowed. A linha de postura, frango de cor, criação talvez de, de, de ovelha, de pequenos animais, né? Qual, outra, qualquer cor que você oferecer para sentado aqui. Menos o carvão, porque o carvão o cara só tá não porque gosta. Mas não tem ninguém que venha querer dizer assim, eu falei carvão porque eu gosto, porque é um trabalho horrível. Você tem que cortar, tem que amildar todinho de motosserra, mas a despesa é grande, que do meio para o fim, se não for um negócio bem controlado, no final não sobra com essas coisas. Se encaixar em alguma na facilidade, né, que procurando... Fugir do, do carvão e buscar um desenvolvimento que não seja que nem o carvão, porque o carvão é muito comprometedor, né? E apesar de ainda ser uma coisa meio ilegal, eles não vêm e não fecham porque não pode, porque eles não, eles não têm sugestão para ti, né? Antonio's situation is a microcosm in the large picture, where the basic reality is it is more profitable to cut the forest than rest a living from the standing forest. The symposium turned its attention to what could be done in the future to stop deforestation. Well, first you have to convince the government that it's really in Brazil's national interest to maintain the forest. As of now, there's a, any government official will say so verbally, but in terms of where the actual money goes in the government's going for building new highways and new dams and so forth, all sorts of things that destroy the forest. Today, mahogany or soya bean can have a higher price because they have a market price that doesn't include the destruction of water and um, the destruction of soil. To change the view of society as a whole, the Amazon has to be perceived as actually underpinning jobs, uh, and an environmental security for the interests of the population as a whole. What we have to achieve is sustainable development. Brazil is going to develop. You have to allow a country such as this to generate an income to provide basic services, schooling, water, health, to very poor rural populations, some of which we've actually seen on this trip. Certainly the thing that we have here that is sustainable and that produces something very valuable is the forest itself. It's been here for thousands of years, and it produces environmental services, such as what comes from biodiversity, the water cycling, and avoiding global warming. And all of those have a value that's much greater than what you can get out of the area by cutting down the forest and selling the wood, uh, planting cattle pasture, and so forth. Throughout the world, we're not paying for the ecological services that maintain our atmosphere, our oceans, our water, and our climate. And one of the things that is important for maintaining our environmental services is maintaining forest on the planet. 
Brazil and the other Amazon countries have the largest rainforest. And that is vital for the future of the planet. It's not a question of um, donating money. I think we're not in favor of that. We're in favor of compensation for environmental services as a mean to create an economic incentive to rubber tappers, indigenous leaders, uh, small-scale agriculture. Everybody has to be stimulated to conserve the forest. In order to convince someone that's actually got his hand on a chainsaw cutting down a tree, you aren't going to do it by, by talking about global warming and all these benefits. It's going to be something related to the, the monetary uh, payoffs at, at, at that end point. So where is the money really going to come from? I think you have the insurance industry, that's one place. There are many other uh, international-based industries um, which could, without really doing too much harm to the underlying business, uh, make a pretty reasonable contribution. One of those would be something called the Tobin tax, which would just place a minuscule tax on all international foreign exchange transactions, which are running at the rate of about $2 trillion a day. Another way of looking at this would be to tighten the emissions regulations on the Annex 1 countries, so the G7 countries, the European community in particular, to lower the uh, amount of emissions that businesses are allowed to put up into the atmosphere. The money is out there in the global economy. Uh, the question is whether there is the will and a sense of individual responsibility to actually do something about it. The money is part of the solution, but is not the whole solution. The whole solution is a change in the model of development and the change of the patterns of consumption in the wealthy countries. It took from the beginning of time to the early 19th century for the world population to reach one billion, and we're now six and a half billion, and heading for about nine billion by the middle of the century. But the consequence of that is that we now produce, in less than two weeks, the entire economic output of the world in 1900. So it's this combination of numbers and rates of consumption that's really putting an intolerable strain on the natural resources of the planet. We also think that it's very important to put a spiritual uh, touch to this because ultimately it's the spirituality that drives a lot of human behavior. And at present, we lack that connection. If I live according to what I want and not according to what I need, then I am taking far too large a portion of the world's resources. And other people don't even have the basic needs that they require for survival, not for luxury. So my lifestyle has, in a sense, to be balanced. People don't have a consciousness about what the purpose they life here is not just to buy, to buy things and destroy things. When people buy one thing, they need to destroy another thing. And my community, we always educate young people. Everything they get from the land, they need to give back. Because before you be born, somebody was preparing for us. And we need to prepare for another generation. You know, the, the, the whole the indigenous way of looking at the world is very inspiring and very, very powerful and full of lessons for all of us. For example, an indigenous person feels that he's been given everything he needs by the Creator at his birth. That therefore relieves him of any sense of needing to accumulate things through the rest of his life, which are only going to clutter him up, get in the way, cause problems, greed, envy, whatever, you know. So the attitude that I've got it all already is absolutely fantastic, frees you up to do all sorts of things. At the point where the two great rivers of the Amazon the Rio Salimois and the Rio Negro come together and flow as one to the sea, the symposium scheduled two ceremonial blessings. One by an indigenous group performed by a chief, the other was to be by the ecumenical patriarch who at the five previous symposia had performed ceremonies blessing the waters. Medicina branca, não consegui curar ele ao fogo.
religion can help if it can listen to the religions which have more respect for nature. That's why I think the indigenous people can teach us a lot. It was a very successful symposium because we learned much from their link to their land. And in the last analysis, it was proved that we need each other. In blessing the waters of the great Amazon, we proclaim our belief that environmental protection is a profoundly moral and spiritual problem that concerns all of us. The initial and crucial response to the environmental crisis is for each of us to bear personal responsibility for the way that we live and for the values that we treasure. To persist in the current path of ecological destruction is not only folly, it is a sin against God and creation. I think the responsibility about rainforest is to every person in this world. I think the patriarch show that religion is important, conciliate with the environment. I think it really make a change if all priests and the path, everyone get the same step that the patriarch is doing. What I coloco para todos se lembrarem é que nós temos muita coisa que Deus nos deu, que é nossa. Temos a água, que faz parte da nossa vida, temos a terra, temos as matas, temos animais que fazem parte da nossa vida. Nós temos que cuidar dessa terra, desses bens, para nós, para nossos filhos, para futuras gerações. There is a thing called forgiveness. I'm not religious, but I know about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And if you can forgive, then you can be forgiven. Uh, so, and, and the, the view of this native uh, Amazonian Indian, to blast a guy from the Catholic Church, like he did today, with grace and kindness, is so powerful. Because this is a representative of an institution that signified they are suffering for 500 years, massacres. And now this guy here, 2006, comes there, very symbolic, in the Amazon River, and blasts the, the representative of the church. So this, this is a proof that forgiveness is, is something. Who knows? Maybe from shaman in the Amazon or from a thinker in the Vatican, you can uh, develop new uh, integrative uh, perceptions and develop new concepts. That we, our humanity has been totally fragmented. We need a union, not fragmentation anymore. Outsiders have long placed a series of fantasies of the infinite on this region of the world. Infinite wealth, infinite space, and today, infinite catastrophe. Yet there is a fourth notion of infinity, and that is the belief in the infinite creative capacity of human beings to find solutions. Can man's creativity and potential to change head off the predicted catastrophe?